Hello, my name is Leonard Kleinrock. I'm chairman of the computer science department at UCLA. We have here a really exciting and dynamic environment. And one of the activities that contributes to that environment and that excitement is the constant flow of visitors who come and spend time with us and interact with our faculty and student body. Each year, we select a few from among the very best researchers in the field and ask them to participate in our distinguished lecture series. The high point of their visit is the presentation of a lecture to our faculty and student body. And at that lecture, they present the state of the art in their field of specialty. They describe the research results, the open problems, and the directions in which the field is likely to go. And as you might expect, these lectures always generate a great deal of enthusiasm and interaction. I'm really pleased you have chosen to join us today. Let's go inside. The lecture's about to begin. Good afternoon. Calm it down. I am sure there'll be a small panic shortly because we ran out of cookies, it seems. So I'll try to hold the fort while you calm down. Today we have our fourth distinguished lecturer, when I asked Mike the two how we'd like to be introduced, he said, just say, here's Mike. But of course, I've got more to say than that, as always. So you'll have to live through the introduction. Um, Mike's dad was a big shot admiral, he says. And so he had his first command of a destroyer at the age of 12. At the age of 14, he managed to fly and crash a glider. He continued to survive. He was into flying extensively. In many ways, his path and mine have been very similar. We grew up in the same city. His happened to be called Athens and mine was called New York. It's really the same city. Mike spent part of his youth exploding munitions left behind by the Germans when they withdrew in World War II. I spent my time throwing cherry bombs and synthesizing gunpowder. And we both lived on the streets of the same kind of a city. Mike built model airplanes. He loved to tinker. He was a C student in high school. And then when he was a sophomore at one of the, in fact, the best high school in, in, in not only in Greece, but all of Europe, presumably, at Athens College, he, uh, as a sophomore, his algebra teacher, with whom he did not perform very well, walked over to him and grabbed hold of the two suspenders, which was the standard attire for the day, and slowly stretched them further and further. And just before he let him go, he said, you can be an A student in algebra. Wham! The next day, <laughs> he was an A student. And he liked it. And he found he could excel, and so that started him on his career. He was always interested in the way lots of different things work. And so not only did he study electrical engineering, he studied cabinetry, jewelry making, machine tools he became an expert at, Quite a breadth. We don't find those kinds of engineers today, I'm sorry to say. What really turned him on into his field is when he was um, in Athens, he read a collection of Scientific American papers in which was described some of the work of Claude Shannon and Claude Shannon's wonderful, wonderful little games with mice and coins and automata and such like. And at that moment, he decided to go to MIT and become a professor. Came to the United States on a Fulbright, went to Arkansas, got his MS, bachelor's in MS and double E. While at the same time, he became director of R&D at Baldwin Piano Company, doing all kinds of shaft encoding work, which led to his PhD at MIT. He worked for Professor Al Susskind, whose area was analog computers and digital, analog to digital conversion. His dissertation was published as an MIT press book. He's the author of six to seven books by this time, Indeed, he, um, his PhD thesis was on threshold logic. He wrote a book called The Computer Age and sold a mere 60,000 copies. Unhappy with that result, he then basically handled the publication and shared the group that put together this book. This book has only sold 400,000 copies and growing. Made in America, a book I recommend to you all. You probably have seen it. It's all about manufacturing and competitiveness in this country. He's received all kinds of teaching and paper awards. 
He uh, basically conceived and headed the Athena Project at MIT, known to all of you. The best thing about Mike is the, the gestalt, the, the, the man himself, and all the things he brings to, uh, to share with us. The title of his talk is An Anathema and a Conundrum, and we'll hear about that in just a moment. But he has a message for you, the famous message. Mike's message is this. It's to the young people for success in the 21st century. It says, go for depth and breadth without becoming a dilettante. Thank you very much. This is very reminiscent of the situation in church where the newly created widow is sitting listening to eulogy after eulogy about her husband who is in a casket. And after a while, she turns down to little Johnny, her son, and says, Johnny, why don't you go up there and look in the casket, see if it's really your father in there. <laughs> so thank you for the kind words, but I'm not sure that's me. I thought I'd talk about something outrageous. And now I'm changing my mind. I wish I had decided to tell you about the research in our lab. It's much more serious and exciting and proper. But yeah, let's have some fun. I was in Bloomingdale <coughs> to shop for Christmas. And um, what happened is that the young lady at the register, she went over every one of the 12 things I bought. And she went with a barcode reader. And that's what you see at one. The numbers got printed. Then she turned around and she started keying in the same stuff. And I said, young lady, and I was ready to give her one of my famous productivity lectures. <laughs> <laughs> and you know how young ladies in Bloomingdale are. They're sort of waiting for these lectures. So she said, <laughs> she said, sir, would you mind waiting a second? I've got work to do. <laughs> she proceeded to write with a ballpoint pen everything down under three. Now, I'm sure this is a conspiracy. The management of Bloomingdale said Michael is coming, and he worries about this thing, so let's really show him how we do it. That, <laughs> yep, I believe that is replied. Here is an example of an ancient human, beautiful and modern looking as she was. She is no different than Plato or Aristotle in her mental powers. In fact, some might argue she is. But, <laughs> <laughs> But she is that same ancient human, yet she was coping with barcode readers, with keyboards, and with ballpoint pens because of the confused management procedures at Bloomingdale at the time. Um, I thought maybe anecdotes are no good, so one anecdote is very bad, say the economists, so I'll move to a second anecdote. Uh, this is real. This happened just about two months ago. So I said, please change my ticket from Boston, New York, to Boston Bridgeport. The agent was very, very nice and said, my pleasure, sir. Now, I, I count these things. This is what I meant by deep breath. It's not enough to be broad and observe this. You have to be deeply broad. So I counted the interactions. 260 keystrokes, I may be off a little bit. <laughs> 24 interactive round trips, you know, 24 times with a little finger, the enter key. And the expression, you know, looking at the screen. 14 minutes of my life. Now, I know you think life is infinite, but when you reach our age, <laughs> 14 minutes is serious business. And then finally, the agent said, here it is, sir, etc. Now, let me ask you a question, because I hate these monologues. Is there anyone here who knows how to do this in 14 seconds instead of 14 minutes? I'm serious. Can you imagine a way that we could do this in 14 seconds instead of 14 minutes? By hand. By hand. <laughs> Possibly, but there are a lot of things to fill in a ticket. I'm thinking more of a slot where you put your ticket in, has your name and everything in, and you either speak Bridgeport or key Bridgeport or any other way you want to do it, even write it. And then it comes back out 
and it's been revised. I mean, 14 seconds should be enough. Why did it take 14 minutes? That's the ratchet fault. The ratchet fault is when you build systems and you keep leaving them inside. So the airline reservation and ticketing systems are ratcheted to death. People keep adding software and there comes a time when they can do no more. That's the excuse. Do you believe it? Yeah, I believe it, but I think it's an excuse. I think it's an excuse because we don't know how to design systems that are properly done to handle change. If they were properly done to handle change, then maybe we wouldn't say it's the ratchet fault. In any event, 14 minutes to 14 seconds is 60 to 1 or 6,000 percent improvement in productivity. That's the figure to keep in mind. Now, the young lady in Bloomingdale's was engaging in a different kind of fault. This is the ratchet fault. She was engaging in what I like to call the additive fault. The additive fault is where we do today everything we used to do before the computer, and then all the things we need to do with the computer to be modern. <laughs> so, you know, she kept writing, but then she had to key it in because that's the computer. Am I going insane? Are people just doing these things to get me? <laughs> yes. No, they uh, do that always see Or, or, <laughs> let me be a little rhetorical, then you can move. Or, is it the fact that this is something far deeper and far more endemic that has crept upon us? Well, let's look. You know, when we did this book that Len held out, The Made in America, uh, the, the vice chairman of our commission was Bob Solow. He got the Nobel in economics. I had a C in economics. And this guy was my vice chairman. Every time I would say something, he would, he would go like that. <laughs> he taught me one thing. He said, anecdotes are terrible. He said, you've got to have aggregate numbers. So I got aggregate numbers. <laughs> this is the senior economist of Morgan Stanley. Now, all of us here are delighted are excited about computer science. And believe you me, I am just excited as you are, despite the color of this hair. I love to hack on my Mac, and I'll trade secrets with you. But something is happening to our field. Now, what, what Mr. Roach observed is that in this period, starting from the 70s to the late 80s, if you compare the productivity change right at this point, relative to what it was the decade before, average productivity-wise. And you know productivity. The stuff you get out for the stuff you put in. The stuff you put in could be labor, measured in dollars, could be equipment, amortized over time, could be both. It's called multi-factor productivity, whatever. It's what you put in and what you can take out. You divide the two and that's your productivity. So he says, let's look at the factories. The factories improved their ability to produce by 17%. The office workers went down 6.5%. Now, you know, when Roach gives this result, people get up, especially people of our ilk, and they start saying, Mr. Roach, how do you measure productivity? You obviously measured me wrong. <laughs> or, <laughs> or, Mr. Roach, if we didn't have the computer, we wouldn't be able to do American Express and all these great things that we do today. Right, 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 simmer down. You want aggregate numbers? I got aggregate numbers. This is true. Maybe it's not the computer that's causing it. Maybe it's the bureaucracy. Maybe it's Washington. <laughs> 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 if the candidates only knew this. <laughs> All right. But look at this curve. Oh, this I love this curve. Glenn Kleinrock and I were grown men when this curve was at zero. <laughs> That is the growth of the computer field in the United States measured in GNP dollars. Today, it is around $500, $400 billion a year. It's $100 billion for hardware, another $60 billion for packaged software, $50 billion. And the balance is all captive inside our nation's companies people called DP managers, <laughs> machines and things, $400 billion, closer to 500. The US GNP today is $5 trillion. So 10% of the economy 
is in computing. 10%. I have not counted in communications because that skews the curves. It goes up to 17%. 10% of the U.S. economy, more than the automobile sector, just as much as we spend in health care, is going to computing. So we went from zero to 10% of the economy with these great machines that we love, and office productivity went down 6%. Mr. Roach may not be calculating things right, but if you ask a man in the street what happened, he'll say something derogatory about us. Now there's another person. More aggregate numbers. His name is Paul Strassman. He goes with Xerox. He's somewhere in the DOD now fixing the defense software. <laughs> now, he's written a 500-page book. And I'll tell you the first 250 pages of this graph. <laughs> <laughs> that's because I got tired and I called him and I said, what are you saying? And he said, that's what I'm saying. So basically, he takes and the reason he has 250 pages, it's a nice book. He takes every measure of computer savvy you can think. How many computer people do you have in your company? How well educated they are? How many computers they have? How many megabytes of storage? How many gigabytes of secondary? How many megahertz clocks? OK, he puts all that on the horizontal axis. And then on the vertical axis, he measures performance, corporate performance. Again, every conceivable man, profit. Return on investment, return on equity, return on this, return on that. He does it for, for 1,000 companies, 2,000 companies. And when he does it, he gets a totally uncorrelated result. <laughs> Can you imagine doing all this work and then getting back this thing which I could have created with a small animal and so <laughs> I got to save the first 250, so he creates the other 250 pages. And what he does there is he, he tries to divide companies in groups to see if he can get a correlation. And finally, he gets the famous aha. He separates the companies into well managed and badly managed companies in one of his experiments. And ta da! <laughs> correlation. Now, you know what this says? This is frightening. If we believe it, it says that the computer and the use of the computer is a magnifying lens on management. If you're a well-managed company, you're going to do a lot better with computers. If you're a badly managed company, you're going to do a lot worse than if you didn't have computers. That is frightening. Yet, wise heads shake, affirming that their experiences match with well, that's interesting, but I've, I've done way too many numbers for my comfort. So I've got to go back to anecdotes. <laughs> I've just added the video frame grabber to my Mac so I can do these things. I just turned around from my desk and photographed my shelf. And I found that I have three and a half inches of word processing manual. <laughs> spreadsheets to add the money that Professor Kleinberg gives me when I lecture here, I found that 11 years. This is serious. <laughs> <laughs> like most people, I like to prepare slides, PowerPoint, and other good things. One and a half feet. Finally, I love to hack, so I program. One Encyclopedia Britannica's worth. <laughs> now we're gonna we're gonna start crying. This is you know there's this mask with the laughter and the crying, the Greek mask. That's how I feel about this. I call this the excessive learning fault. Now I've got to carry these manuals. Now, of course, nobody reads manuals. I don't read manuals except when I have to. But somebody reads manuals. Otherwise, people would be crazy to produce all this stuff. So we have one EBs of knowledge. You know, the same printed bits of knowledge that go in here, go in here, in order to do what? Ask yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> what old 
people, the people with the cane shaking, used to do this way. <laughs> <laughs> this is the database, three by five cards. These are the color markers, still here. And this is the pencil for word processing, <laughs> for which the manuals are still rather thin. <laughs> now, why do I put this up? Do I put this up to say, ah, oh, the good old times and the bad new times? No. I put this up to force us to think. Here is how I'd like for us to think. Look at this picture. Think about that. Think about what you can do today with your Mac, or your son, or your list machine, or whatever turns you on. And ask yourself, does all this one EB of knowledge correspond to something comparable on the side of what you gain? I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm not trying to force you that it doesn't. I'm trying to ask you to think. We're all in computers. We're all doing marvelous things with multiprocessors, this and the other. But ultimately, when that stuff goes out there and people use it, how are they better off? Are they better off? Which way does the sign go before we measure the quantity? And then, how are they better off? Now, I can answer this question myself. I couldn't have done these slides if I didn't have my PowerPoint and I got a few thousand slides. <laughs> I can put it together. But studies at Carnegie on word processing, fascinating study of word processing, Star starts with, with just a concept and produces a letter. One team did it by hand. Another one did it with a, with a word processor. And then they gauged the speed. The speed was a little faster with a, with a machine because the, the other person who hand wrote and then typed it once had to get it right in one or two tries. But then they measured another thing. How effective are the letters? In other words, you're writing a letter to somebody. You say, dear Professor Kleinberg, you're hereby fired as head of the department. <laughs> Sign D X Y Z. Now, you know, if I write this by hand or with a word processor, if I justify it, if I use LaTeX, does it make a difference? The guy's fired. <laughs> so, you got to think a little bit about effectiveness. So, not saying computers are bad. Anybody who infers that is not listening carefully. <laughs> so we got three faults so far. The additive fault, the ratchet fault, the excessive learning fault. These are ways in which we're misusing computers today. Never mind if Mr. Roach is wrong or right with his aggregate numbers. Who cares? Maybe we can improve how we use computers. OK, how many people in the room are into AI? These are the people who are going to get very angry. <laughs> this is my modeling contest. <laughs> there are many ways to phrase the AI question. This is the way I like to phrase it. Namely, should I keep a model of my computer, my program, whatever, in my mind? Should I know that if I want to achieve the following great result, I've got to do, you know, backslash star three. Or should the computer have a model of me in its internals so that it knows what I want to do and it says, here it is. There's a classic scene that my colleague Nicholas Negroponte describes. He says, he opens the door, he walks into his house, and he says to his wife, did you forget? She says, no, I did, but. And Nick says, oh, but that's because he. And she says, no, no, it's not that. It's the other one. He says, oh, I see. There's <laughs> <laughs> a lot of modeling. <laughs> now, I ask the question. Now, let's put a little depth behind it. <coughs> if we had a servant, somebody who served us, and we had plenty of money to hire that servant, what would we want that servant to be like? Would we want that servant to have a model of us in his or her mind? Or would we want to have a model of the servant? Clearly, we'd like the servant to have a model of what we want. You know, here you are. I'm sure you're going to ask for your breakfast, sir. Here it is. The problem is that we don't have computers that are as clever as human servants. So what happens 
is that maybe the alarm clock rings by accident, and the computer says, here's your breakfast. In other words, intelligence, fake intelligence, gets interposed between human intent and what the machine thinks human intent is. Now that, I'm sure you face it yourselves in a variety of ways. I've just got recently a great car and it came with a phone in it. And it's a very intelligent computerized phone. It recognizes my voice. So I push a button and I say, Ann, and it repeats, Ann, and then it dials Ann. Uh, sometimes I say, George, and it says, Ann, but that's <laughs> If I say George the same way I say Anne, it always says Anne. <laughs> but that's not the issue. What I want to say here is that every time I do that, it lowers the volume of my stereo so I can hear my phone. Well, the other day Tsongas was speaking, and I'm involved with Tsongas because I'm a Greek and all Greeks work together. <laughs> and I wanted somebody to hear what Tsongas was saying. And the minute I dialed the person, the volume got dim. <laughs> so then I said, surely there must be a way. After that, it became an MIT issue. You know, I have to micro change the microcode into this thing so it can do that. And if I want to raise the volume, no way. <laughs> the intelligence got into my brain. So yes, let us at all times try to use the maximal intelligence that we can. But let's be very careful with that can. Because fake intelligence can get in the way and destroy what we're trying to do. That, then, I submit to you, is another way in which ancient humans are being tortured by modern computers. Let's summarize. So we talked about the excessive <laughs> learning of all. We, we talked about the additive fault. I didn't tell you anything about the perfection fault. Now, you know what I'm talking about here? You could have finished after the first try, but you don't. You have all the toolbox things, and you keep reorganizing things, and you keep changing the colors and the shading and putting a drop shadow. <laughs> That's the perfection. I do that. I love it. <laughs> I'm totally disinterested in the content of a slide. It's the appearance. <laughs> so. So that's the perfection fault. The fake intelligence fault we talked about, the ratchet fault we talked about. That brings me to feature shock, and I love that word. So uh, Len is the first one to use it, though there are others who have thought of this idea. And that great author of the book, The Design of Everyday Things, <coughs> psychologist, I forget his name. Oh, no, no. Right. He's got, I think, a wonderful take on that. But the way I view it in our own business, and you know, we all program, so we understand what we're saying. We are so fascinated with the wondrousness of our equipment and our programs and the power. And we say, look, for just a little bit more, I can give this a feature. The question, though, is not what features I can give. The question is what features can be remembered? <laughs> what features are necessary? And um, the, the new ISDN phones are an example of this as you sit and, and you say, my God, I can conference call, but how do I conference call if you forget? You have to go find the manual and so forth and so forth. So <coughs> what is my bottom line for this first half of my talk? I don't think it's an accident. I don't think that we're witnessing a few sick anecdotes. I think that since we are at the very beginning of our business, we're only merely in the 30th year of computing. I remind you that from steam engine to jet aircraft, it's 240 years. Now, we're only in the 30th year of our field. We're so fascinated by what computers can do that we haven't paid very much attention to that. And computers are helping us. They're doing great things. They're showing us the way up the information age but we're also misusing them in great big ways. You know what the worst way is? I was going to have a video, an, an audio tape for you, but I then said, nah, that's too theatrical. 
But I'm talking about the automated operators. You know when you pick up the phone and you call and you hear this incredible if. If you wish the sales department, press one. If you wish the engineering department, press two. If, if. So you press beep and then you hear another tree. Now, right? Right. right. Think about this. Think about this. This has no entertainment value. Think what you're doing. A computer sitting somewhere is dispensing machine-level <laughs> routines which you are executing. <laughs> this, ladies and gentlemen, I submit is unequivocally ancient humans at the service of modern computers. <laughs> okay, we're down at the bottom of the pit. Now let's bring it up. How do we fix it? <laughs> That's why we're all here. Well, clearly, we'd like to think creatively. We've got to find ways to improve things. But <clears throat> what do we have? What are our tools besides creativity? Our technology. So where is our lovely technology headed? This is my one slide. It's a 20-year projection of our technology. serious. Now, every computer, every computer is going to be a multiprocessor. That's simple. This is the best way to organize silicon locally. It's happening already, but slowly because of programming problems, uh, which may persist for 20 years, but 25 years, every computer is going to be a multiprocessor. Globally, Silicon is best organized in networks. I think we all know this. Networks in a building, networks in a city, networks in a country, networks across the international barriers. It follows from these two that the structure of tomorrow's systems, when most of you young people here are at the peak of your careers, most of the systems you'll be facing will be networked multiprocessors. Workstations will be multiprocessors. They may have only 100 or 10 instead of 10,000 or 100,000 processors. But that's the systems you're going to be seeing. Second point is the interaction between the humans and the machines is, in my opinion, going to be the dominant theme of at least your lives in computing. I think as you get power, and we're having this wonderful discussion with Rajiv, who's working on parallel languages, as, as power comes your way, you're no longer interested in saving 15% of efficiency. So you design your languages, you design your interactions so as to make life easier and more productive for the human beings that are going to use these machines. And we've been developing the engines, we've been developing the structures, the systems, the software, all these wondrous things. Now the question is, how are we going to use them easily, effectively, for human purposes? So if I had to give you a one sentence forecast, I would say natural and easy human interaction with network multiprocessors for productive rather than faddish or whatever other uses. Now here I would put speech. And I, I said in my abstract, what are the five big challenges? I think one of the challenges is understanding the multiprocessor. There is this space of programming it, what applications you use, and what architecture it has. That's the three space we're trying to understand. Over a hundred experiments worldwide are trying to understand this space, and we don't understand it well. We know machines are converging somewhere, we still don't understand it. One of our biggest challenges is to understand and program these things. Why don't we have a language around that is a parallel language for programming parallel machines? It's as famous as Fortran. Why is Fortran still famous after 20-some years? Why are people saying Fortran? And I said in my abstract, and I'll say it here, there was a step back then from nothing or machine and assembly language to Fortran. And that step, Jerry Estern is in the audience, I hope. He knows that step. That step has yet to be matched. 
by a comparable step in terms of effectiveness. Why? Maybe, maybe it's fighting us? I don't think so. Here is a big challenge. I think many other young people here could go out and develop a language for programming parallel machines that would be suited for human beings, not for machines, and the machines will follow. So that's one of the big challenges. Another one is here, distributed systems. How do we build these things? How do we build these things so they work? This is, there's a lot of work going on at UCLA. So that they're robust, so that they can understand each other. What language do they understand? Do they just scream at each other uninterpreted bites? I mean, is, is, is our vision of the future email? <laughs> email with a human note reading and interpreting? Is that our vision of the future? Of course not. That's nonsense. That, that's medieval stuff. We've got to get to where the machines can interpret what they're hearing. To do that, there's got to be a language that's understood by the machines. What is the language? I'm using the term in its simplest possible meaning. What is the language? that these machines will understand, other than the uninterpreted byte, or down at the bottom, the X25s and, and all that stuff. I think there's a lot of challenge here. There's a lot of challenge on the multiprocessor. And just before I take it off, there's a lot of challenge on the speech, which I think is the first real interaction we'll see in terms of, say, visual speech gesture and all that. We'll see the multimodal stuff later, but I believe in speech as the first one. So here are the three big ones. Now, the other two, I'll tell you at some length. The fourth challenge for me is being able <coughs> to make machines do what you want much more easily. That ties right back into our theme of the first half of the talk. So let me see if I can give you the idea, because I'd like to challenge you here. <coughs> here is traditional programming. I don't care what your favorite language is. I love it. Just tell me what it is. Is it C? Is it Pascal? Is it Lisp? Whatever. This is what it takes. You want to achieve something, you've got to keep working, working, working until you achieve it. Now, try to remember, some of you may remember when spreadsheets first appeared. Somebody took you on the side and said, hey, look, you put a number in this cell, you put a number below it, then underneath you say equals the sum of this and that. And magically, it gives you the answer. And if you change one of the cells, the answer, and you say, yeah, 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 don't tell me anymore. And you go away, and you've got all you need to do 70% of your work. Then, of course, you want to do more, you open the door, the macros come in, and you know, <laughs> you're powering the need to go to the bathroom. But the point is that spreadsheets <coughs> made this possible. Small effort, huge gain, and then work hard to do the detail. Now I ask, can you do this for programming? Programming is an arcane practiced by very few people in the scheme of things. Can we change it? Can we change the meaning of programming? I think so. I'd like to argue with you that we can. Let me try to give you some indications. First indication. <coughs> I went and looked at the Dartmouth Basic Manual. It had 80 instructions total out of which eight were I.O. 72 were inner language things. Decision, repetition, iteration, procedures, functions. No procedures, no functions. Number statements, whatever. 10% were I.O. Then I went to Microsoft Basic, including toolbox calls. I get some 460 total instructions, of which I.O. is this. Again, a pretty picture, but let's try to look for some depth in it. Back in 1970, the programming language was the reigning emperor, and the I.O. was a little diddle hanging on its side. And that's how people thought and still think about it. Today, the I.O. is the reigning emperor, and the programming language is a diddle on its side. You may not like this, but that's what the usage is saying. The 
command are where people need them, and they need I.O. So I observe this as a trend, a trend that says we've moved in the direction of heavy, heavy I.O. Second observation. Suppose I take your favorite application on a Macintosh or a PC, whatever you like. Say it's spreadsheets. And say I take another one, which is databases. Take FileMaker, for example, and Excel. And intersect the two and ask you to tell me, how many of the commands do you think are common? They may have a different syntax. But where this application moves information, this moves information. Where this one navigates, this one helps me navigate. Where this one has error things, this one has error things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How many of these do you think have the same semantics, in some sense? They do the same thing, but they have a different syntax. Would you take a guess? I've measured them, actually. 80%. Did you say 80%? Would you please identify yourself? <laughs> <laughs> okay, give the talk. <laughs> uh, that's pretty good. But I guess it's the Pareto rule. Everything is 80 20. This is an incredible observation. If you take any two applications and do that, you get an 80% hit. If you get more than two, and you get the full intersection, you get about 70%. 70% of the commands out there are the same. Yet we have to relearn them, part of the learning form. So keep these observations in mind. First observation is I.O. and language, traditional language, have flipped. Second observation is the I.O. commands. Uh, I'm sorry. Second observation is that 80% between any two and 70% among the aggregate of applications seem to have common, common commands. Let's make some more observations. So we said more intensive I.O. But we're living in a world that's globally distributed. Lots of machines out there, networks, talking to them. And locally, increasingly parallel. It's a third observation. Do these trends spell an opportunity in anybody's mind? I was always bothered that there were operating systems and languages and communication subsystems and environments. And all these were opportunities to just create the same commands with different syntax. Suppose we put it all in one bag. I'm talking now about an operating system you're going to construct for the year 2000. Put it all in one bag. Let's construct an environment, a shell, that we put on top of our machines and on top of our communication systems, on top of the world that is out there behind the machine. Let's include, first of all, a very heavy input-output orientation. What do I mean by this? How many of you have used Prototyper by Smether Barnes? How many of you use ResEdit? It's a little bit like ResEdit. OK. Basically, you drag interface objects. You drag little buttons. You drag little screens. You drag things that are visible. You bring them in on your window. And you don't need any knowledge of programming. Anybody can do that. So you say, this is how I'd like my interface to be. And you start your program from your interface. This is what I want to do. You don't start from inside some heavy algorithm. You start from what you want to do. When I push this button, I want this to happen. When I push that button, I want that to happen. Wonderful. So far, we have a complete winner in our hands. And there are about five or six products out there that do this today. But guess what happens after that? Nothing. They stop right there. You push the button and they compile into about three or four inches of C code. And then you go in there, and it says, dear sir, this is the place where you place the C program for what happens when you push button XYJ slash 39. 
So now you leave this wonderful world where you drag the interface. It looked good there for a while. You were building that. <laughs> and now you say, oh my god, I got global, global variables. I got to have local variables. I got data structures. How to organize, you know, open up Knuth. What does Knuth say about this? You know, impossibly difficult. <laughs> He's a good friend. I love him. Very difficult. <coughs> you are into the arcane world of programming. And all this was just a fake. Got you interested? And then he said, you're back. <laughs> But I would like for this language to start that way, and I don't want it to stop. After you brought the buttons in, I want you to lift the button, go behind it, and say, when I push this button, I want it to do this. Now, that's difficult. What is this? All right. So I'm going to give you a menu, a rich menu of things. Now, you've got to be careful here. You're going to be a specialist. What do you like to do? Are you an accountant? I'm sure you're not, but let me pick that up. Let's say you are an accountant. So what you're after is you want to be able to reconcile, you want to do cash balances, you want to post things. This is the language of accounting. And there are modules. There are modules that do these things. Now, we can afford to put these modules there because we've taken 70% of the nonsense that's there now and we brought it down into the operating system. So now we can put more and specialize for accountants, for musicians, for whatever. So now, you flip your button, and here is a challenge. You reach up, grab something, and say, that's what I want to happen. And it's there, it's ready. You know what I call this? Shallow programming. I think it's great. Shallow programming. If you can achieve, again, 70, 80% of your objectives as an accountant, you're happy. You are back at that curve. Very quickly, you achieved it at one shallow level, it does what you want. If you can't do it, well, then we have to open the door and bring in more stuff, and it becomes more difficult. But nobody said that everything would be for free. All we want is to change the curve from this to that. So that's another way to do it. So I'd like to go for shallow programming, and then go deeper if I have to. And at any time, I'd like to flip a lever and see a finished application run. Now today, it's not quite like this. There are make programs, there are all kinds of, of compilation things, linkage schemes that have to be kept up to date, and it's not easy for you to do it. But suppose you had a system that could have all these lovely features. Well, my bottom line is that everyone would then become a programmer. Same slide. What do I mean by everyone? Everyone who's using spreadsheets today, if you go to corporate America, Almost every middle manager knows how to use these things. And the younger people coming up know more of them. That's what I mean by everyone. So they would grab the system, work at it, and they would have the ability to program with a lot more ease than we have today. Now, another view of this system, pretty picture, is this. You have rails. These rails are fairly hard interfaces of the 70, 80% common goodies. Some are command rails for navigating, for doing arithmetic, for building things, like concatenating things together, or taking them apart. And they're the same from program to program to program. Some are interfaces of data, text, sound, video, again the same. The specialized modules plug in, they're like today's applications. But since we've taken most of the applications of today and put them down below, now we can afford to go much deeper into the individual fields and have these modules offer specialties. And of course, we program these on our favorite platforms. And I call it MVC because it's my virtual computer, except a month ago I was at Microsoft, so I said it's the Microsoft virtual computer. <laughs> <laughs> so here is then one challenge. And I'd like to say to you that perhaps you don't like the way that I'm thinking of it, but do your own. Here is my sign. Invent a better and more productive way to redefine programming as an activity that is easy, available, and useful to everyone. You can use some of these ideas, but I'm sure if you go to it, you'll come up with better. Let me now switch to the last point I want to make.
And that has to do with systems that you are working at here a lot. Infrastructure. Information systems structured as networks, I think can be viewed profitably <coughs> as information infrastructure. In, in my little view of things, I see all the computers at the periphery of something which basically facilitates these machines talking to each other. There is not much smarts in here. You expect this infrastructure to carry information reliably or less reliably if you're transporting pictures. Who wants it to be very reliable? If a human is interpreting it, you can lose 1%. If it's money or software, it has to be 100% reliable. So you've got some levers there inside to control reliability, control speed, control security. It's open or not. But these are the things that all of us are building on making tomorrow's networks effective. The key is not there. The key, I think, to utilization productivity is higher. What do these computers do with the information infrastructure? To first order, we've got to get away from the mindset that says humans must read everything. So my little picture of what it should do is this. Today we're being bogged down, and maybe that's why Mr. Roach sees a minus 6% on office productivity. Because we have to read everything. We have to process everything. And then we generate a lot of nonsense. A lot of information that's not used by anybody. We would like the machines to handle the heavy lines. To handle lots of information, to interpret it, to understand it. And we would like to keep for ourselves the thin lines, the exciting stuff, the interesting stuff. Then we could move up the productivity ladder. Can this be done? It's very much like the previous problem. But before we can go for a cure, let's look back at what some older infrastructures made possible and see if we are anywhere near them. I think there are only three properties that an infrastructure has. It's available, it's easy, and it permits many uses of it. Look at the phone. There's a phone right here. I blew it. <laughs> it's a virtual phone, right? Uh, it's easy to use. You pick it up and you speak. But now this is the key. The phone is the infrastructure. Imagine somebody writing a paper. On, what can you discuss over the telephone? It's ridiculous. You can discuss everything over the telephone. Contracts, love chats, family, blah, 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 blah. Jillions of things. The same with roads. There's a road just outside. It's easy to use. You walk on it or you roll. That may be a little harder, but it's easy, it's easy to use. But here again is the key. Jillions of uses. You transport produce, people, school children, blah, blah, blah. OK, ask the question. Are we anywhere near this stage today with our network? <coughs> are they available? Perhaps. In this building, there are. Maybe there's one, one and a half computers per person, networks, yes. All right, let's, let's chalk off availability and say you got it. Are they easy to use? No. Not even by us, let alone ordinary mortals. <laughs> How about jillions of things? Can we, as our commercial friends say, interoperate these machines and programs and build applications? Every car manufacturer has a database of their cars, the dimensions, and everything. I am looking, I was looking for a car for my son to sit in the back seat. My son is six foot nine. Now, if I could access these databases, I might be able to do it, but I couldn't. I couldn't. Certainly, they were all available, but I couldn't find a way to talk to them. The answer is Audi. <laughs> Here's one way to do it. I like that way. I call it e-forms. Don't take it too seriously. That's my way. I want you to invent your way. What is an e-form? An e-form to first order is like a form you use today. So let's say I produce vegetables and you buy vegetables. So we agree to use the vegetable purchase and sale e-form. And it says on it, you know, has a slot where I put tomatoes or, you know, oranges or whatever. Has another slot where I put the amount, et cetera, et cetera. 
So the language of purchase and sale of oranges is handled by E form number 2160. The language of transactions for shoes or for registration of UCLA is handled by something else. The point is that the users in the periphery agree on what are the things that they will do at the level of the application. They agree on a common format, and the e-form is the simplest one to think. And then you can fill it in by speech. And we've just finished one at MIT where we can book flight reservations. You may see it, the ATIS system. It works pretty close to real time. It has about a 500 word vocabulary, continuous speech, untrained. You say, I want to go to San Francisco. And it says, from where? <laughs> Boston, blah, blah. You go through the dialogue. And it books a flight at roughly the same time it takes you to do it with an airline agent. It's easy to do speech understanding if you're filling only six slots. It's very impossible to do speech understanding if you're trying to discuss philosophy. Just filling six slots, he knows that what's going to go in this slot is San Francisco or Boston, so it's easy to translate. No bot is another way of doing this thing. Dr. Khan invented that term. These are agents, as you know, that understand the different formats in which information, like information, is represented. And for example, in my car example, they go around and they know that Audi stores their dimension this way, and they check, and they go check with General Motors, and they come back and give me the answer in a way I understand. Very difficult because of intelligence again, which is difficult to automate. To me, if we were to achieve the e-forms well, we would achieve international transactions much better. The EEC, a force that we will all see in the future more of, because it's bigger than America financially, especially when Eastern Europe joins it has a problem. It's got 12 languages. This could be a key to EEC transactions and transactions between us and the EEC and then with the Asian side. <coughs> you basically fill it in in English and you order oranges from Greece and the order comes out in Greek, either spoken or typed. And one of the problems of the world goes away because translation is again easy if you're translating against six or seven slots. Now, you may not like e-forms. I'm trying to suggest to you a way to think to increase productivity of the network environment. So here's the assignment. Now, I think this is serious. I think this is a big problem. The problem facing us is not piping bits around. I even said about reliability and security and speed. All that's great, but it's not the big problem. The big problem is what handles do we use? How do we grab the information? How do we exchange it? What is the language that we're going to use at that high level to do useful cooperative work, to do transactions, to do this, to do that? I gave you one little example, e-forms. Please think and come up with better ways, more ways to do this. This is what we need. Without it, we are like wild people screaming at each other. And we cannot understand what we're screaming. We have to build understanding. and. I would very much like to see what you come up with. I've come to the point where I will gracefully release you from this torture. I have three more minutes. And I'd like to end on a techno-philosophical note, as if the previous stuff was different. Uh, what is the value of information? This is the question I'd like to ask. So I went and looked at the books. And I found that there were not many answers. And there was some work done by Professor Arab at Harvard. And it was very much information theoretic. He said the value of information is this ambiguation of some kind of a secret. You know, if you know that the stock price is going to go up and so forth, you take P log B, whatever, and you get a number. I didn't like that. I didn't think it made much, much sense. So I defined my own. I believe that information has value if and only if it leads to some human desire. I think information has economic value, if and only if it leads to some economic desire being satisfied. Buying something, consuming a service, making money, that's economic value. Has intangible value if it leads to an intangible human desire being satisfied. So if you know that your loved one is coming on the six o'clock plane, 
and then you get this new piece of information that the plane's late, <laughs> it's coming at 8, that has intangible value. You can adjust your time and all that. If you're an, an encyclopedia maker, and I give you a list of all the people who buy encyclopedias, who will buy encyclopedias, you will value that list backwards from the money you can make. If I give you the list here, you can make a million dollars. Maybe you'll give me 20,000. Maybe 2%, 3%. Discount your problem. So we can think of valuing information with respect to the goods that it makes possible. This is a key concept. My point is that if there are no goods here, then there is no value. It leads nowhere. And this happens all the time. I mean, what's valuable to you may not satisfy my own desires, and it's, for me, it's info junk. For you, it's very valuable. Now, when we're in a network, everybody has valuable stuff to himself or to their friends, but to everybody else, it's info junk. Just before coming here, a distinguished member of your faculty asked me, how do I handle email? I'm getting so many hundreds of messages a day. So what if that list of encyclopedia children is not quite ready? What if you can buy a list of all the children who are of encyclopedia age and another list of all the children whose families have enough money to buy an encyclopedia? And then you process these two together to get the list that you want. Then you can discount back and assign some value to the process and some value to the original list. So maybe we have a way of valuing information. Why do I bring all this? Because I'd like to close with a question of what does this teach me? I asked in my abstract, is computing going to help Bangladesh and Japan equally? The answer, I believe, is no. I believe <coughs> that if a country is very wealthy economically, it has a lot more use for information because it has a lot more physical goods and services to which information can lead. So Japan can use information a lot more than Bangladesh. And indeed, in the US, in Western Europe, and in Japan, computing is about, as I said earlier, 10% of the respective GMPs. But if you go to Bangladesh, computing is way, way down. Now, do things get better? I don't think so. And that's why I bring it up here. Left to its own devices, I think computer technology may skew the rich from the poor. And we have to be particularly vigilant for that. As practitioners of the art, as future <coughs> business people in this area, we have to be careful and we have to make sure that we help the poorer countries. Second point I want to make. If there is no real wealth, the information colossus collapses. If we speak of a post-industrial society, where everything is done with virtual things and computers and thinking, and nobody's making things, and nobody's eating, nobody has real tangible wealth, that world doesn't exist. So let's get off the bandwagon of a post-industrial virtual information age. It only derives its value from the existence of a real tangible economic world that satisfies directly human desires. If that world is there, then the information world can be there. Finally, the point I made earlier, information only has relative value. And one person's valuable info is another's info. Therefore, we must use our computers in our networks and throughout to shield us from other info junk. And finally, this brings me to the conclusion. I hope I have convinced you on the first part of my talk that there is something to the notion that as ancient humans, we are inadvertently serving modern computers. I would now like to convince you of your final assignment, which I truly hope you will do in your careers, for which I wish you the best of luck. Reverse the frame. Thank you very much.